Welcome to the Tudor Dixon Podcast. I am grateful today to be joined by Vice President Mike Pence and his daughter, Charlotte Pence, to talk about the book they wrote together called Go Home for Dinner. My dad and I, this this book is like really important to me because my dad and I had a very close relationship. And this interview means a lot to me because I lost my dad to cancer last year. And he was also someone who believed that it was very important to go home for dinner. And I wanted to share a little story about that because sometimes you don't realize when you're a little kid that this is happening. You know, you don't always know what the behind the scenes of your parents is. But um, when I was older, I worked with my dad. I had the blessing of being able to work with him for many years. And one of the guys that he worked with had worked with him when we lived in Illinois and was his one of his vice presidents at the time. And so my dad, we lived in Illinois in the suburbs of Chicago, and my dad had to every week go to a foundry in Keokuk, Iowa. And when I was, so I, you know, that was when I was a kid. And then when I was in my 20s and 30s, I was working with one of the guys that worked with him in Iowa. And he told me this story. He said, you know, your dad was such a bore. And it was meant to be a huge insult to me. And I could tell we were on a business trip. And he said, we used to have to go to Iowa and we would go out every night and your dad would always go home. He would make that five hour drive home because he always said it was more important to be home than it was to be out with the guys bonding with the team. And it was really important to us that he be bonding with the team. And it was like this moment where I thought, that was my dad. It was so important for him to be with us that he would definitely take that five hour drive at night to make sure that in the morning he was there when we woke up. And I read this, I was, I was looking at some of the stories in this book and it just reminded me so much of that story. And I think that it's beautiful because living in a family focused household is important. And right now we see that there's a breakdown in society on that too many people are not living in that family focused household. And we have moms and dads both working life gets in the way and people go, well, I'll make that quality time, but I don't have that quantity time available to my kids. And really it's both that matter. And so I want to bring in vice president Mike Pence and his daughter Charlotte to talk about how that quantity time meant so much in their relationship and talk about their book, Go Home for Dinners. Welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you being here. Well, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Tudor. I, I almost feel like we ought to just sign off after that um, <laughs> moving opening and our sympathies in, in, in the passing of your father. Sounds like a wonderful man. Well, thank you. Reminds me a lot of my father. My dad was a, was a salesman, helped build a small business uh, in a small town. Um, but had the same practice wherever he was at the end of a sales day, he was driving home and it was at the dinner table. And, um, uh, when, uh, when, when we uh, got the idea for this book, uh, it, it came from, uh, an answer I used to give people back when I was in Congress, uh, for 12 years, people would sometimes come up to me after I'd started to show up on the house floor more often and on cable television, they'd they'd ask that flattering question, which is, where do you see yourself in five years? You know, you, you've gotten that question before. Yeah. <laughs> and because everybody in Washington has got a plan, right? Well, I, I, I would always answer it the same way. I'd say, where do I see myself in five years? I'd say home for dinner because mm -hmm. I, I never needed to be motivated to want to make a difference in the world. I never need to be motivated to work hard. But I learned early on, and we and we try and write about it in this book, uh, uh, some hard lessons along the way, early unsuccessful efforts at politics that um, I became convicted both in, in, in my faith and through my upbringing that I needed to really put my family first. But but in doing that, it's I think it's really enabled us to, to do the things that we've been able to do. But the joy of being able to write this with my daughter, who is the best writer in the family by far, uh, was a particular joy for me. So, so thanks for having us on and sharing your story. Absolutely. Well, that was why I thought this was so neat because when my dad came to me years ago, I mean, this was, um, early 2000, he came to me and he said, I'm buying a foundry in Michigan and I want you to come there and work with me. And my first reaction was no way. Like, there is no way I'm going to work with you because families work together. They fight. It's going to be a disaster. I'm not doing it. And my dad is a great salesman. So he, finally got convinced to me to do this. 
And it was the best experience. Like those 10 years of working together, it was so cool because you don't necessarily, when you're when you're in the household, you don't necessarily see the hard work that your parents are doing because you see the the parent and not the worker. And I got to see him in his element in what he did that impacted the world, which was making steel castings for all of this equipment we use every day, whether it's a train or a tractor, it's impacting your life. And I feel like, Charlotte, you had the same experience. You got to see your dad and see how his heart worked for his service and what he did to impact the world every day. What was that like for you to kind of delve deep, especially at a time where you're still in the spotlight and and it's a tough spotlight right now, a very tough spotlight. So as daughter, what's it like to go through that? Yeah, you know, um, it's funny because I, I, I really relate to what you said that, you know, you don't necessarily know what your parents are doing while they're raising you at the same time. You're just kind of seeing that. Um, and that's kind of your normal. So I do think, um, my dad has said in interviews since we've been doing promotions for the book that, you know, it was hard for him to like, it was hard to go home for dinner. Um, it was hard to be with his family. It wasn't really hard to work hard. And I don't think I really knew that as a kid. And I think that's a testament to him and my mom and, and kind of the, the culture that they built in our family, that family did come first. It didn't seem like a burden to him to be with us on Sundays and, uh, you know, coming home from dinner when he could and also taking us with him on trips. We got to go and kind of see him working and going on trips as a congressman, which that was just a cool thing to be able to do as a kid. Um, I think writing the book especially was impactful for me because of the time that I'm at in my life too. Um, I just had my first daughter, my first kid, uh, my daughter, and she uh, really lined up with this book. We started writing it right, right before she was born. And it just was a good reminder all the time for me to put her first or my husband first over even this book because I felt like I couldn't go out and do these interviews later and pu publish the book and be talking about how oh yeah it's important for you to put your family first if I wrote the book and totally ignored my husband <laughs> and my daughter um I just felt like that would be hypocritical so I really tried to like focus on her as much as I could um you know and when she was awake in the newborn stage they're not awake for very long periods of time, but I tried to really focus on her and just be there um, when she needed me. And, you know, sometimes that was inconvenient. Um, and so I think that 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 was just something that I, I think it, I think lining this book lined up well with my life in particular right now and being able to work on it with my dad as he's reflecting on raising us with my mom was just really cool. You took some convincing to head to the foundry with your dad. It actually was the other way around. Uh, for me, my, my daughter's very modest. She actually has a best-selling children's book under her belt. She writes for the Daily Wire on a regular basis. I wrote a book about our family when I was vice president and um, is a very accomplished writer. But she was eight months pregnant uh, when, <laughs> when this book was getting started. And as a dad, I just struggled with asking her to do it. And I, I really, I really commend her because uh, she, she lived out that balance. I mean, literally there were, there were times we were working on the book on a, in a, uh, you know, a setting just like this. Uh, she in California where, where her husband is stationed, and me in Indiana, and she had her, that little baby on her lap. Uh, but uh, she, she worked out that balance and it just made the whole experience more special for us. But it's, I hope people, when they read this book though, um, come away with hopefully a smile on their face. I hope they come away with a sense that we, we don't think we have all the answers, but we really do believe that, that faith makes a family and, and family makes a life. And as we put a priority on our faith and on our families, we'll be blessed. Well, and that's one thing that I did want to go through because I, faith is obviously a big theme in this book, the major theme in this book, and it, it should be the major theme in our lives. But for a lot of people, a lot of folks have drifted away from faith. But sometimes I think someone could read something like this and say it's it's too much. So I do have to ask, 
were there ever moments because I've ha- I've had this experience. So maybe I just want you to say, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I don't know. But were there ever moments in life as you were raising the kids where you did get pulled away and you had because I have those moments where, you know, you're campaigning and you can't be home. I mean, you're you're gone and you come home and I've had my girls now. My girls are I have twins that are 10 and then 12 and 14. So they're all at ages where they're willing to tell you whatever they think of you at any moment. Right. And they're not shy about it. But I've had those moments where they've said, you're never home. You don't love us. And you get convicted and you're like, OK, I've I've screwed up and I've got to fix this. I mean, for those imperfect people who are reading this and say, I can't achieve that. Were there ever moments where that happened to you? Something similar happened to you and you said, I've got to re- recalibrate here and get back. Oh, uh, before before Charlotte answers it with uh, <laughs> specificity. Yes, of course. It was, it was it's I hope this book comes across as as aspirational. Mm. Uh, because, you know, I was a congressman for 12 years. I was a governor for four and as vice president of the United States. My life uh, and became increasingly complex, the obligations and duties. But what I hope people pick up is that there's there are decisions that you make along the way that will will make it more possible for you to spend more time with your family than you would have otherwise. In our case, uh, Tudor, um, when we were elected to Congress, we we actually our kids were young. Charlotte, you were about eight years old, I think. We we moved our young family to Washington D.C. to be with me during the school year, and then move. You know, they were, spent summers home here in Indiana. But that was all about when you talk about your kids being willing to tell you what they think. I used to say to people, you know, I could come back from Capitol Hill and maybe having had a meeting with President Bush and maybe done an interview on cable television feeling pretty good about myself. And I'd walk into a little house where there were four people that had no respect for me whatsoever. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> but it, but it keep, my family was there with us. We stayed together. Uh, and in this book, we also try and, and say that when, when you, when you're able to be there, be there, but not, uh, Charlotte, Charlotte can tell you how it actually worked out in real life for us, but it was, it was always the goal. Uh, but uh, but it happened in a very busy life, didn't it, Char? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's yeah. We, when we were writing this book, we really didn't want it to come across like, oh, great, Mike Pence was home for dinner. Like, good for you, Mike Pence. <laughs> like, I can't do that every night. And no, I mean, of course, there were nights he wasn't home for dinner. I mean, but the the idea was that he tried to be home for dinner, and that we knew he wanted to be home for dinner. So I think that's even more important is communicating that. Um, that was never a question. It was never, I never thought he would rather be off doing some, you know, meeting or interview or something. I knew he wanted to be with us and still know that. And I also think, I mean, when we were writing as well, we really tried to include um, other options for families and just kind of get the message across of the the sentiment behind being home for dinner. My, my husband's in the military. And so there are lots of nights he's not home for dinner. So we kind of spoke about that early on and we wanted to make sure people knew, you know, if you work the night shift, if you're in the military, if you, you know, have late nights, it's, that doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It's just getting across that message to your kids that you want to be there um, and that they come first over your job. So sometimes you are going to, have decisions that you can make uh, that put them first, and it might come at a a, a loss uh, in your career, but that will ultimately be worth it. Do you think that comes with maturity, though, too? Because I think over time, when you're first starting out your career, you feel like I've got to be there for everything. You talk about a time when you had the opportunity to meet with President Bush or you could go to a violin concert and you it was Charlotte's violin concert and you chose the concert and i think that i think that comes not only with faith but maturity and faith that you can say i can step away from this and put something else first that doesn't just happen at the beginning of life does it well it didn't happen at the beginning of my life i promise you we you know i i grew up in a great uh, family sounds sounds awful lot like yours uh, tutor really tries my uh, my father's gone 30 years but uh, if it's any comfort to you he's still the biggest part of my life today as, as he was the day he left us um, and um, 
we got a line in the book uh, that uh, the good fathers never leave you, uh, the pain phase, true. But, but never the impact and the memories. Uh, but I had a great foundation in, in my life. But to be honest with you, even, even after I uh, came to faith in Jesus Christ as a, as a freshman in college, once I got out in the world, got out of law school, I, I hit the campaign trail as a 29-year-old. I ran a couple of times for Congress, and I ended up uh, I ended up really running campaigns. Ultimately, I wasn't proud of, and I think part of that mm. was a lack of balance uh, in our lives. It was in, in the course of those campaigns, as I wrote about in, in my autobiography, that uh, we came to the conclusion that even in the midst of busy campaigns, we, we need to take Sunday for our family. Uh, we need to rest. Uh, uh, and, and I can honestly tell you that all the way through my service as a, as a governor of Indiana and as vice president, we, we always carved out a Sunday morning for church. We carved out a Sunday afternoons uh, for rest and refreshment, be with family whenever we could. But those were hard lessons that we learned, and I, I learned them through disappointment uh, in, in my own life and through um, uh, losses and in in defeats uh, in, in my public career. Uh, but uh, as we write about in the book about, about the middle 1990s when the kids had just come along, I'd, I'd come across a very powerful uh, verse uh, in the Bible that, um, that essentially, uh, essentially encouraged us to... to leave to God whatever his purpose was for us uh, and to recognize that our my, my primary calling in life is to be uh, the husband and father that he's called me to be. And uh, that, as it says in Genesis uh, 18, 19, God will fulfill his purpose for us uh, if we see to the members of our own household. And that's where we, we put faith first in this book. And I, I hope it's a, I hope it's a blessing to people, whatever their faith tradition. I think it's important to have this conversation about faith because people who are new to faith or outside of that faith group in their lives, but curious, I think that they think Christians want you to come in and immediately be faithful. And I think sometimes ma Christians mature in their faith are like, this is the way to live, live it now. But you, you just said something powerful to me. This was when you were a senior in high school, and then your faith grew. Faith is a journey. Everybody is on a different part of that journey, and it takes time. I mean, there needs to be grace for people who are exploring faith and coming to faith. Why do you think so many people think Christians are like, you're either in or you're out? Why is that impression out there? Well, well, Charlotte, I'm, I'm going to pitch it to her because she inspired a chapter of this book in particular from great work she's done on um, that we shouldn't fear our doubts. I mean, she and I both came to, mm. to faith in Christ through doubts, through literally walking away from faith. But, uh, but Charlotte, you're, we both write about our own journey, but, but she, she's done some very eloquent work on that very question in her generation. Oh, well, thanks. I mean, we, we do, we do have a chapter that's called don't fear your doubts and it's kind of a testimony chapter. Um, it includes our both of our testimonies really and i i really like that it's in there i did a podcast a couple years ago that was called doubting it and i interviewed people about their faith journey but kind of asked them about specifically you know when they had doubts and i i felt like a lot of people in our generate in my generation the kind of when i came out of grad school i felt like a lot of people really struggled in their faith because maybe they had never um not been encouraged to doubt, but had never been allowed to doubt their faith. And they just kind of were um, told this is the way it is. And if you don't question it, and then when they go into the world and there are questions thrown at them, uh, they don't really know how to answer it. And it's extremely unnerving. A lot of times people will lose their faith. And so I wanted to kind of explore that. And so when we wrote that chapter, um, it was it was important, I think, for us to get across that both of us had doubts and both of us had to um, kind of push away our faith, maybe not walk away from it, but kind of push it away, kind of not be as interested, um, kind of do our own thing and think that we could just go off and, you know, um, not really follow Christ. And at least that was my experience. And yeah. And then I, I kind of came back around and my dad kind of talks about his journey too. And, and I like the end of the chapter talks about, um, you know, if you, if you do have doubt, 
follow it through, you know, see where it leads you because, um, you know, God will answer our questions. I mean, that's in the Bible that's um, asking you will receive. And so if you do seek the answers, you'll find them. And so that's, that's something that we wanted to get across in this book too. And, and again, not have it come across like a cookie cutter, um, you know, perfect Christian book. Um, there were even times actually where we were writing <laughs> and I would use a word and my dad would actually say, we got to find a different word. Cause that's like a Christianese word. That's like, <laughs> we want this to everybody to, <laughs> to know what we mean. <laughs> and I didn't even know I was doing it. Yeah. You live it and you don't realize that that is something that could turn someone off or make them make it so that they have like kind of that block, you know, some people's hearts have that block around them and we are meant to not build that block, but to break that block away. And that's been something that I think I've seen so many people since I, because I told my faith story on this podcast just a, just a few days ago. Um, so folks that are listening regularly know that I also uh, came to faith when I was older and uh, I just see those roadblocks and I I I know where the other side is pushing to break down faith. And so I think it is really important for parents to read this because what you just said, I think is so key that you can doubt. And as parents, we can let our kids doubt because I have so many parents who are like, my kid went to college. And I think we're seeing this right now with what we're seeing at colleges with the anti-Israel message. A lot of parents are panicking. And I think that the panic is the right word, because if you think your child is going to be on a path that doesn't lead to eternal life, then you can panic and panic can lead you to do the wrong things. The idea of talking to your child and saying, hey, this is okay. Take that journey, to, but but actually take the journey. That's something that I don't think we always think about is telling them to take the journey of doubt because <laughs> we want them to take the journey of faith. Well, Charlotte came up with it. She, I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, we quote him in the book that um, that uh, most men lead lives of quiet desperation. Um, that that they live in between faith uh, and mm. and doubt, and they never, they never. A lot of times, people never embrace those issues. And I thought that the way Charlotte um, just expressed it, and that we express it in the book, is intended to say. Uh, come on, go ahead. Don't don't live in between. Uh, and and I, and for Karen and me, we always believed in letting our kids, training our children up in the way they should go, um, sharing our faith with our kids. But we always believed that our we want to raise kids to think for themselves. And uh, I, I think they knew that from early on that that we, we would love them regardless and and respect them. And um, uh, but the one of the things in this book and. Uh, is th there's a, a couple of chapters in there about falling short and they're not about Charlotte. Uh, <laughs> I, I told her, how come we're not writing about where you fell short? Uh, <laughs> I, no, I wanna, I wanna... You can see where you fell short and she can see it. <laughs> there was a time when I, I was governor of Indiana and I was all caught up in my, my very first few months as, as governor of this great state. And, um, I uh, had a big speech scheduled and my, my wife had a health issue and I, I made just a very poor decision not to drop mm -hmm. everything I was doing and go by her side, uh, but to go to a big event. And I didn't want 2000 people, uh, you know, um, waiting and not hearing my remarks. And it was just a, a tutor. It was just a fundamentally bad decision. <laughs> and my wife, because she's an incredible person, has forgiven me long ago for it, but I'm not, not sure I've forgiven myself. And so I, I hope, like I said, I hope people, uh, I hope people read this book and maybe get a smile. You know, there's some, some, some chapters in there that are meant just to, uh, uh, you know, let you know that we don't take ourselves too seriously, but I, I hope also they pick up uh, a sense of humility about this whole business. 38 years married. Uh, we, we don't have it all figured out. Uh, we're, we're the parents of three incredible uh, young men and women, and, and they have great spouses and three perfect granddaughters. But uh, we, other than that, we, uh, we're, we're learning as we go here. And, but for us, it ultimately is, uh, um, 
it, I, I hope people might be able to read this book and just and, and see that in the busy workaday life that we've lived in, um, that if you put your faith in your family first, you'll be blessed. Anyone who has run for office, I can tell you, knows that your wife is a very forgiving person because you've run several times. And that is hard. <laughs> but you actually talk about her being forgiving in the book and, and from Charlotte's perspective. So I have to ask because you write a chapter on being together on January 6th. It was a very hard day. And I want to say um, for folks who are critical of January 6th, um, about six months after I was meeting with a congressman who had been in the building on January 6th. And this man who was such a strong guy and you would never, you would never think that something could get to him. You know, he's just such a tough guy sat across from me. They had been in hearings with the whole Nancy Pelosi committee and all of that. And I sat down with him and he said, I don't think that people realize what it was for us that day because we don't see the outside we didn't see what was happening we were told there were people coming and he said i remember having just a knife in my pocket and he started to cry and, and he said i i we put one of the desks we got under the desk and i thought i'll probably not see my kids again but i'll try to protect everybody in this room because he said we didn't know what was happening and i think people don't hear the perspective of the folks that that didn't know what was happening on the outside that day, that didn't have the perspective that you have when you're watching it on TV. And I thought that was, you know, for a moment it took me back where I thought, it's just something I didn't know. And this is someone who couldn't make a phone call, couldn't say goodbye, didn't know what was happening. I think people think, well, that's ridiculous. It wasn't that bad. But for the people in that room that day, it was bad. And you were obviously in an incredibly tough position that day. And since then, there has been a lot that has come your way. And folks that have said, oh, well, we don't agree with what he did. And I know what that's like as a person who stood there and been the person that they criticize. But for my kids, I don't know what that's like. So Charlotte, you had a moment where you you got mad and your mom had some really interesting advice for you, which I think is powerful and people should hear it. So would you be willing to share that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm glad you picked up, uh, you picked that actually from that chapter because it's kind of a small part of the chapter, but it's actually really impactful. So I do write one chapter in the book. It's the last chapter um, and the... Uh, directive in it, I guess it's called stay. And it's about staying with your family when things get tough. So I, my mom and I were at the uh, Capitol with my dad on January 6th. Obviously we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, we knew it'd be kind of a tough day though. It was going to be kind of weird because of everything that was in the news and it was going to be kind of hard for him. I mean, he jokes, you know, he says I was also on the ballot. So it's not like, you know, fun for me to like, you know, give it to somebody else, um, give the win to someone else. So we were just going to go and support him. Um, and then things kind of started happening. You can read about it in the book. Um, I kind of detail how we ended up going down to more of a secure location, um, away from the office that was like right near the Senate chambers. And, yeah, I did. Um, we were watching, I think most of the inter most of the information we got was from Twitter. And I was on Twitter and other people were kind of looking at Twitter because obviously we didn't have a TV or anything. We didn't really know either what was going on. And we were getting some information, but mostly looking online. And I, I, I talked about the former president and I said, it's unforgivable. I said, like, this is unforgivable, basically, um, to my mom. And she kind of corrected me and essentially told me, you know, nothing is unforgivable. Like, you can't say that. And it did really convict me because later on in the days that followed, I really did have to work through forgiving him, forgiving other people that were involved that I had been friends with, very close with. And I felt had put my dad at risk. And, um, you know, I, and I'd say in the book too, like, I, 
that day, January 6th was a very unifying day. You know, I got texts from lots of people in my life who were encouraging on that day. And then since then, it just became so politicized, like you were just alluding to, um, and very political. I think people took it very personally. And, but at the time it was pretty unifying. I mean, everybody was pretty upset that that was happening in America. And I do think that it was something that it taught me, my mom saying that to me was, first of all, very, a very good mom moment <laughs> and that, um, something I needed to hear. And I don't, I mean, I admire her for so many reasons, but especially for having the clarity of mind to still parent me in my, you know, 28 year old, 29 year old self in like a, you know, hiding spot <laughs> on January 6th saying, no, um, you don't decide who's forgiven. And that was just really true. And, 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 you know, we're, commanded in the Bible to forgive as the Lord forgave you, first of all. So I am commanded to forgive. Um, but I really believe that you, like there have been times in my life where I've really had to ask God for his forgiveness for people, you know, because I think really as human beings, it's nearly impossible for us to forgive on our own when we are wronged or uh, hurt. And it's something that I I just think is just, I don't know, just an important message to kind of get across that you can ask for this and, um, and, and, and being able to forgive someone the way that we have been forgiven um, it is, is something we're supposed to do. And it's a hard thing to do. I do remember days after like journaling and trying to like work through this because it was a really tough thing. Um, my dad is my hero. Um, I, I, the way you talk about your dad, obviously you have the same feelings. I mean, to have somebody do something that I felt put him at risk. I mean, you can't even, I can't even talk about yet how that would make me feel and how it made me feel at the time and having to forgive, um, and, and working through that was something I, I really had to do. And I did have to pray about it. And it's not something that comes naturally. It's not something that's easy, but I had to remember even in that moment that I don't decide who's forgiven and nothing is unforgivable. Well, and the, and I think the interesting thing that you learn in those times where when it's very hard is that forgiveness is freeing if you can get there because the the cage of unforgiveness is only holding you in. It's not holding the person that you're not forgiving in. And and that's that's the problem. And I think that I want to ask you, Mr. Vice President, because obviously this is hard for you as well. You write in the book about your passion is to serve and that you dreamt one day of being president yourself. It would have been a lot easier to get there had you decided I'm going to throw things out and make sure we're in office and I'm going to make sure that we serve another four years or to heck with the Constitution. I'll do what I can and see if I can then get there. But it wasn't you knew that wasn't the step to take. You knew that. And you knew it was going to hurt your image with people. But you still have this passion to go out there and serve. Do you see another opportunity for you to go out there and bring the people to your side and one day run again for president? <laughs> well, um, you know, we like to say at our house, too. We don't You're know. like 20 years younger than the candidates out there now. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm young. I'm at 64. That's young, right? <laughs> no, like, we, we like to say we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Um, and I, I appreciate your generous words. It's, you know, uh, look, there, there were voting irregularities that took place. Um, I was very clear about my conviction about that, but I also, I also knew what my duty was under the constitution that day. Um, uh, the oath that I'd taken in January, 2017 to support, uh, the constitution of the United States, the role of the vice president, simply to preside over a joint session of Congress where, where Michigan's electoral votes, Indiana's electoral votes will be opened and counted. Uh, and we did that. You know, I, I often thought in those days leading up to uh, January 6th, uh, Psalm 15 says he keeps his oath even when it hurts. Uh, and to your point, uh, I, I know something about that. But um, yeah. 
uh, over the last several years, I've had uh, I've been so moved, even during our recent campaign for president um, this summer, by how many people have come up and expressed appreciation uh, and support uh, for what we did. But the reason that that stays the last chapter of this book is is more about my daughter and my wife than it is about about me. I mean, a, a lot of people don't know that Karen and and, and Charlotte were there the whole time. Um, that they were there till four in the morning when the the constitutional process was concluded, because they wouldn't leave. Either. They, <laughs> you know, I I had held a deep conviction that I was not going to leave my post. I I made a decision to stay at the Capitol. I thought I could facilitate a response um, uh, by law enforcement to quell the violence to to move the process forward if I stayed uh, in the building. Uh, but in all fairness, I did encourage Charlotte and her mother to to uh, go back to the vice president's residence, and uh, they refused. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it was one of the greatest gifts uh, that they'd ever given me was that they just stayed. And you know, when and Charlotte ended that chapter, which she wrote every word of, and and she also dictated it on the uh, audio version of the book uh, in a very moving way. She just said, you know, when. When uh, when when trouble is at the door, um, in the midst of everything else, when it comes to your family, just stay, just mm. be with one another. And I hope beyond the controversy that day, I hope I hope that's an enduring lesson uh, for people because it's it's been one of the keys that our family, through thick and thin, through hardship, through loss, um, uh, have been there with each other. Uh, and um, I hope that I hope people come away with that conclusion in the book as well. I'll also tell you, finally, uh, Tudor, that, you know, this isn't a policy book. I've got a lot of public policy in my other book, I reflect on uh, my journey as a conservative leader. Um, but at the end, Charlotte and I wrote in, in the epilogue uh, my belief that, that, you know, the family is in free fall in this country. I mean, it was mm -hmm. about the time I was born, you know, uh, you know, one in 10 households uh, had just one occupant. Now that's it's about a third uh, of American households today uh, only have one parent or one person living alone. You know, the Bible says God puts the lonely in families. And so many times people have come up to me over the years and said, boy, other than supporting candidates, you know, like, like Tudor Dixon and yourself and other people that I believe, other than supporting candidates and donating time and resources, what can I do? And um, I hope they come away with a the conclusion they can go home for dinner. That you know, if you, you want to, I actually think the key for really renewing our nation uh, is closer to the dinner table than it is to any um, uh, any any table or podium in our nation's capital. It's it's uh, look, electing the right people is vitally important. Passing the right laws, respecting our liberties, our values, uh, absolutely essential. But underneath all of that. Uh, is the family and the vitality of the family. And I, I want to thank you for being such a clarion voice uh, for family and for life over the years. Uh, I, I think we renew that, then uh, uh, I, I'm confident we, say, we save the family, we'll save America if we go home for dinner. No, I think that that's how you, people vote for the right people when the family is strong. I mean, I, I do, I agree. It's, it is the foundation that everything else is built upon. And, and that foundation of family is built on faith. So I love this. I I want to say that I want people to go get this book. It is called Go Home for Dinner because this is the time, the season where a lot of people feel lost and lonely in the holiday season, even though family is around. This is how you can make that experience rich, make it enriched and, and enrich the people around you by reading this and refocusing that. But beyond this book, because this book is something that you wrote with your daughter and I think people could go, oh, well, that was his daughter. I want people to know that throughout my campaign and since I met you, you have always taken time. And that is something that you just kind of know when you're with someone, that this is someone who genuinely cares. And I want you to know how much I've appreciated it, no matter when it's been, whether it's me seeing you in the airport <laughs> or seeing you at an event, you stop and you talk and you ask how I am and you ask how things are going and you're willing to give me advice. And the other thing is this man was the vice president of the United States. And if I call, he picks up the phone and he talks to me and he genuinely cares. So 
I think it's beautiful that your daughter has been able to say these wonderful things about you, but I think people should know that it's because it comes from a place of truth, because you really are a genuine person who is there to help others. And I appreciate that so much. And I am so thankful to you, Vice President Mike Pence, and your daughter, Charlotte Pence Bond. Thank you for coming on today and talking about it. Thank you, Tudor. Great to be with you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. For this episode and others, go to TudorDixonPodcast.com. You can subscribe right there or head over to the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And join us next time on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. Have a blessed day.